Okay, everyone, welcome to the AWS Partner Showcase. This is season one, episode three, and I'm your host, Lisa Martin. I've got two great guests here with me to talk about women in tech. Hillary Ashton joins us, the Chief Product Officer at Teradata, and Danielle Greshock is back with us, the ISV PSA Director at AWS. Ladies, it's great to have you on the program talking through such an important topic. Hillary, let's go ahead and start with you. Give us a little bit of an intro into you, your background, and a little bit about Teradata. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Hillary Ashton. I head up the products organization. So that's our engineering product management office of the CTO team um, at Teradata. I've been with Teradata for just about three years and really have spent the last several decades, if I can say that, in the data and analytics space. Um, I spent time uh, really focused on the value of, of analytics at scale, and I'm super excited to be here at Teradata. I'm also a mom of two teenage boys, and so as we talk about women in tech, I think there's um, uh, lots of different dimensions and angles of that. Um, at Teradata, we are partnered very deeply with AWS, and happy to talk a little bit more about that um, throughout this discussion as well. Excellent, a busy mom of two teen boys. My goodness, I don't know how you do it. Let's now look at Teradata's views of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's a, it's a topic that's important to everyone, but give us a snapshot into some of the initiatives that Teradata has there. Yeah, I have to say, I am super proud to be working at Teradata. We have gone through a, a series of transformations, but I think it starts with culture and we are deeply committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's really more than just a statement here. It's just how we live our lives um, and we use uh, data to back that up. Um, in fact, we were named one of the world's most ethical companies for the 13th year in a row. Um, and all of our executive leadership team has taken an oath around DEI that's available on LinkedIn as well. So um, in fact, our leadership team reporting into the CEO is just about 50-50 um, men and women, which is the first time I've worked in a company where that has been the case. And I think as individuals, we can probably appreciate what a huge difference that makes in terms of not just being a representative, but truly being on a, on a diverse and equitable uh, team. And I think it really uh, improves the behaviors that we can bring um, to our office. There's so much value in that. It's impressive to see about a 50-50 at the leadership level. That's not something that we see very often. Tell me how you, Hillary, how did you get into tech? Were you an engineering person by computer science or did you have more of a zigzaggy path to where you are now? I'm going to pick door number two and say more zigzaggy. Um, I th started off thinking um, that I started off as a political science major or a government major, um, and I was probably destined to go into um, the law field, but actually took a summer course at Harvard. I did not go to Harvard, but I took a summer course there and learned a lot about multimedia and some programming, and that really set me on a trajectory of how um, data and analytics can truly provide value and, and outcomes to our customers. Um, and I have been living that life ever since um, I graduated from college. So um, I was very excited and privileged in my early career to uh, work in a company where I found after my first year that I was managing um, uh, kids, people who had graduated from Harvard Business School and from MIT Sloan School. Um, and that was super crazy because I did not go to either of those schools, but I sort of have always had a natural knack for how do you take technology and, and the really cool things that technology can do, but because I'm not a programmer by training, I'm really focused on the value that I'm able to help um, organizations really extract value um, from the technology that we can create, which I think is fantastic. I think there's so much value in having a zigzag path into tech. You bring, Danielle, you and I have talked about this many times. You, you bring such breadth and such a, a wide perspective that really is such a value add to teams. Danielle, talk to us from AWS's perspective about what can be done to encourage more young women to get in, and, under, and underrepresented groups as well to get into STEM and stay. Yeah, and this is definitely a challenge as we're trying to grow our organization and kind of shift the numbers. And the reality is, especially with the more senior folks in our organization, unless you bring folks with a zigzag path, the likelihood is you won't be able to change the numbers that you have. Um, but for me, it's really been about uh, looking at that uh, 
the folks who are just graduating college, maybe in other roles where they are adjacent to technology and to try to spark their interest and show that, yes, they can do it. Because oftentimes it's really about believing in themselves and, and realizing that we need folks with all sorts of different perspectives to kind of come in to be able to help really um, provide both products and services and solutions for all types of people inside of technology, which requires all sorts of perspectives. Yeah, the diverse perspectives. There's so much value and there's a lot of data that demonstrates how much value revenue impact organizations can make by having diversity, especially at the leadership level. Hillary, let's go back to you. We talked about your career path. You talked about some of the importance, the, the focus on DEI at Terra Data, but what are what do you think can be done to encourage to sorry to recruit more young women and underrepresented groups into tech? Any any carrots there that you think are really important that we need to be dangling more of? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll build on what Danielle just said. I think the um, bringing in diverse understandings. Um, of, of customer outcomes. I mean, I, that we've really moved from technology for technology's sake. And I know AWS and Teradata have had a lot of conversations on how do we drive customer outcomes that are differentiated in the market and really being customer centric. And technology is wonderful. You can do wonderful things with it. You can do not so wonderful things with it as well. But unless you're really focused on the outcomes and what customers are seeking, um, technology is not hugely valuable. And so I think bringing in people who understand um, voice of customer, who understand those outcomes, and those are not necessarily the, the, the folks who are PhD in mathematics or statistics. Um, those can be people who understand a day in the life of a data scientist or a day in the life of a citizen data scientist. And so really working to bridge the high impact technology with the practical kind of usability, usefulness of data and analytics in our cases, I think is something that we need more of in tech and sort of demystifying tech and freeing technology so that everybody can use it and having a really wide range of people who understand not just the bits and bytes and, and how to program, but also the value and outcomes that technology through data and analytics can drive. Yeah, you know, we often talk about the hard skills, but their soft skills are equally, if not more important, but even just being curious, being willing to ask questions, being af not afraid to be vulnerable, being able to show those sides of your personality. I think those are important for, for young women and underrepresented groups to understand that those are just as important as some of the harder technical skills that can be taught. That's right. What do you think about from a bias perspective? Hillary, what have you seen in the tech industry and how do you think we can leverage culture, as you talked about, to help dial down some of the biases that are going on. Yeah, I mean, I think first of all, and, and there's some interesting data out there that says that 90% of the population, which includes a lot of women, have some inherent bias in their day-to-day -day behaviors when it comes to, to women in particular. But I'm sure that that is true across all kinds of, of um, diverse and underrepresented folks in, in the world. And so I think acknowledging that we have bias and actually really learning how what that can look like, how that can show up. We might be sitting here and thinking, oh, of course, I don't have any bias. And then you realize that um, as you as you learn more about um, different types of bias, that actually you do need to kind of um, account for that and change behaviors. And so I think learning is sort of a fundamental um, uh, grounding for all of us to really know what bias looks like, know how it shows up in each of us. Um, if we're leaders, know how it shows up in our teams and make sure that we are constantly getting better. We're, we're not gonna be perfect anytime soon, but I think being on a path to improvement to overcoming bias um, is, really, is really critical. And part of that is really starting the dialogue, having the conversations, holding ourselves and each other accountable um, when things aren't going in, in, a, in a copacetic way and being able to talk openly about that, that felt um, like maybe there's some bias in that interaction and how do we um, how do we make good on that? How do we change our, our behavior fundamentally? Of course, data and analytics can have some bias in it as well. And so I think as we look at the, the technology aspect of bias, 
Um, looking at, at ethical AI, I think is a, a really important uh, additional area. And I'm sure we could spend another 20 minutes talking about that, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk more about sort of the bias um, and the, over, the opportunity to overcome bias in data and analytics as well. Yeah, the opportunity to overcome it is definitely there. You bring up a couple of really good points, Hillary. It, it starts with awareness. We need to be aware that there are inherent biases in data, in thought, and also to your other point, hold people accountable, ourselves, our teammates. That's critical to being able to, to dial that back down. Danielle, I want to get your perspective on, on your view of women in leadership roles. Do you think that we have good representation or we still have work to do in there? I definitely think in both technical and product roles, we definitely have some work to do. And, you know, when I think about um, our partnership with Teradata, part of the reason why it's so important is, you know, Teradata solution is really the brains of a lot of companies, um, you know, the, what, how, what they differentiate on, how they figure out insights into their business. And it's, it's all about the product itself and the data. And the same is true at AWS. And, you know, we really could do some work to have some more women in these technical roles, as well as in the product, shaping the products, uh, just for all the reasons that we just kind of talked about over the last 10 minutes, um, in order to, you know, move bias out of our, um, out of our solutions, and also to just build better products and have uh, better, you know, outcomes for customers. So I think there's a bit of work to do still. I agree. There's definitely a bit of work to do, and it's all about delivering those better outcomes for customers at the end of the day. We need to figure out what the right ways are of doing that and working together in a community. Um, we've had, obviously, a lot of change in the last couple of years. Hillary, what's your, what have you seen in terms of the impact that the pandemic has had on the status of women in tech? Has it been a pro, a silver lining, the opposite? What are you seeing? Yeah, I mean, certainly there's data out there that tells us factually that it has been um, very difficult for women during COVID-19. Um, women have uh, dropped out of the workforce for a wide range of, of reasons. Um, and, and that I think is going to set us back, all of us, the, the royal us or the royal we back um, years and years. Um, and, and it's very unfortunate because I think we were at a time when we we're making great progress and now to see COVID um, setting us back in, in such a powerful way. I think there's work to be done to understand how do we bring people back into the workforce? Um, how do we do that? Understanding work-life balance better, understanding virtual and remote working better. I think in the technology sector, um, we've really embraced um, hybrid virtual work and are, are empowering people to bring their whole selves to work. And I think if anything, these, these Zoom calls have um, both for the men and the women on my team. In fact, I would say much more so for the men on my team. I'm seeing, I was seeing more kids in the background, more kind of split childcare duties, more ability to start talking about um, other responsibilities that maybe they had, uh, especially in the early days of COVID where maybe daycares were shut down and um, you had, you know, maybe a parent was sick. And so we saw quite a lot of um, people bringing their whole selves to the office, which I think was was really wonderful. Um, uh, even our CEO saw some of that. And I think um, that that really changes the dialogue, right? It changes it to maybe scheduling meetings at a time when um, people can do it after daycare drop off um, and really allowing that both for men and for women makes it better for, for women overall. So I would like to think that this hybrid working um, environment and that this um, a uh, whole view into somebody's life that COVID has really provided for, probably for white collar workers, if I'm being honest, for um, people who are in a, at a better point of privilege, they don't necessarily have to go into the office every day. I would like to think that tech can lead the way in um, you know, coming out of the, the old COVID. I don't know if we have a new COVID coming, but the old COVID and really leading the way for women and for people um, to transform how we do work um, leveraging data and analytics, but also um, overcoming some of the, the disparities that exist for women in particular in the workforce. Yeah, I think there's, there's, like we say, there's a lot of opportunity there. And I like your point of hopefully tech can be that guiding light that shows us this can be done. We're all humans at the end of the day. And ultimately, if we're able to have some sort of work-life balance, everything benefits 
our work, we're more productive, higher performing teams, impacts customers, right? There's so much value that can be gleaned from, from that hybrid model and embracing for humans. We need to be able to, to work when we can. We've learned that you don't have to be you know, in an office 24-7, commuting crazy hours, flying all around the world. We can get a lot of things done in a ways that fit people's lives rather than taking command over it. I want to get your advice, Hillary. If you were to talk to your younger self, what would be some of the key pieces of advice you would say? And Danielle and I have talked about this before, and sometimes we, we would both agree on like, ask more questions. Don't be afraid to raise your hand. But what advice would you give your younger self and that younger generation in terms of being inspired to get into tech? Oh, inspired and being in tech. You know, I think looking at technology as in some ways, I feel like we do a disservice to um, inclusion when we talk about STEM, because I think STEM can be kind of daunting. It can be a little scary for people, for younger people. When I when I go and talk to folks at schools, I think STEM is like, oh, all the super smart kids are over there. They're all like maybe they're all men. And so um, it's, it's a little uh, intimidating. Um, and STEM is actually you know, especially for um, people joining the workforce today, it's actually how you've been living your life since you were born. I mean, you know STEM inside and out because you walk around with a phone and you know how to get your internet working. And like, that is technology, right? Fundamentally. And so demystifying STEM as something that is around how we um, actually make our, our lives useful and, and how we can change outcomes um, through technology, I think is maybe a different lens to put on it. So, and there's absolutely, for, for hard scientists, there's absolutely a, a great place in the world for folks who wanna pursue that. And men and women can do that. So I, I don't want to be um, uh, setting the wrong expectations, but I, I think STEM is, is very holistic in, um, in the change that's happening globally for us today across economies, across global warming, across all kinds of impactful issues. And so I think everybody who's interested in, in some of that world change can participate in STEM. It just may be through a different through a different lens than how we classically talk about STEM. So I think there's great opportunity to demystify STEM. I think also um, what I would tell my younger self is, choose your bosses wisely. And that sounds really funny. That sounds like inside out almost, but I think choose the person that you're gonna work for in your first five to seven years, and it might be more than one person, but be, be selective. Maybe be a little less selective about the exact company or the exact title. I think picking somebody that, you know, we talk about mentors and we talk about sponsors and those are important, um, but the person you're gonna spend in your early career a lot of your day with, a lot who's going to influence a lot of the outcomes for you, that is the person that you, I think, want to be more selective about um, because that person can set you up for success and give you opportunities and set you on course to be um, a standout or that person can hold you back and that person can put you in the corner and not invite you to the meetings and not give you those opportunities. And so we're in an economy today where you actually can... Um, be a little bit picky about who you go and work for. And I would encourage my younger self. I actually, I just lucked out actually, but I think that um, my first boss really set me um, up for success, gave me a lot of feedback and coaching. Um, and some of it was really hard to hear, but it really set me up for, for um, the, the path that I've been on ever since. So it, that would be my advice. I love that advice. I, it's brilliant. I didn't think it choose your bosses wisely isn't something that we primarily think about. I think a lot of people think about the big name companies that they want to go after and put on their resume, but you bring up a great point. And Danielle and I have talked about this with other guests about mentors and sponsors. I think that is brilliant advice and also more work to do to demystify STEM. But luckily we have great female leaders like the two of you helping us to do that. Ladies, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the program today and talking through what you're seeing in DE and I, what your companies are doing, and the opportunities that we have to move the needle. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Great to see you, Danielle. Thank you, Lisa. Nice you. My pleasure. For my guests, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching the AWS Partner Showcase, Season 1, Episode 3.